Hey, everybody. Um, I was just sitting here after uh, wrapping up with AI Inside with uh, Jeff Jarvis, and we actually had Micah Elgin on to talk about all the big news from this week in artificial intelligence, Google I.O., OpenAI's GPT-4.0, and a few other stories. And uh, I just realized, like, at the end of the show... I didn't really get a chance to talk about all the things that are really on my mind from Google I.O. I was there at Google I.O. yesterday. I got to be in the audience and kind of see the keynote announcement and to get a sense of, you know, all, all the news that AI was was uh, delivering. Or <laughs> see, I said AI because it's so easy to because literally that's all that Google was talking about was artificial intelligence. Is that a good thing or is that a bad thing? I don't know. I'm a fan of AI. So I kind of like, you know, the wall of news. But what I realized is that it became a wall of noise. Uh, very quickly. So I thought I'd kind of dive into a few of the things that I noticed and that kind of caught my attention from the event, just as like a little bit of a wrap up. A couple of things that I heard from the stage that caught my attention. One was the quote, on the path to AGI. All the technology companies right now have this, maybe not all of them, but a lot of them are making a big stink about the fact that their AI is going to get so good that somewhere in the future, be it near or distant, uh, they are going to at some point get artificial ge general intelligence and uh, narrow in on that and you know become create an AI system that is not discernible from a human being. Do I believe that that's going to happen? I honestly, I don't think it's impossible. You know, Jeff Jarvis seems to seems to not believe that we're going to see AGI. I think it's possible to get there. I don't know how near term that actually is, but I did think that it was worth you know pointing out that Google really had that you know near the top of the keynote, if, if memory serves. They also said the ultimate goal of infinite context. You know, not having this in unlimited pool of context to inform their Gemini and whatever else, you know, uh, whatever other AI systems they're going to be, uh, you know, fostering and cultivating in the coming years. And uh, I don't know, that that stuck out for me. I was like, ultimate goal of infinite context. Isn't there... There's got it like it is finite, right? Like there there is a limit to this. Um, and I don't know saying that your target is unlimited, infinite just kind of seems like an impossible goal. I mean, sure, there's you know, there's a lot of context to be gleaned, but absolutely unlimited, infinite. I don't know, seemed like a, a little bit of a stretch. What are some of the things that really stood out for me? Well, first of all, they were talking about search. Now, I've been using you know the search generative experience for Google uh, search. I've been on you know using the beta for quite a while now. I don't know how many months, but uh, quite a few months. No more beta at this point. So essentially, the SGE experience is going to hit everyone, at least here in the U.S in your search uh, page when you visit Google and, and put in a search query. No way to opt out, as far as I know, right now. And what you will see, if you have not used these before, is you will see these AI overviews. Essentially, you put in a search term, search query, and it will give you your results kind of in the bottom half of the page, but the very top portion, which is actually very, um, prime real estate for these things to exist, which tells you exactly how much Google wants this to be noticed and to be used and interacted with, you'll get those AI overviews, which essentially takes your search query and takes some of the results that it deems appropriate for the query and you know, kind of highlights them or summarizes them, uh, comes up with some sort of a, you know, a quick bit or a blurb about that search query. And if it's something, you know, like, how do I do this thing? How do I change, you know, the, I don't know, the filter in my air conditioner, you know, and you put the, the model number, it might come back with, with some sort of like a walkthrough or a small tutorial to kind of show you how to do that. I, my experience with SGE has been that it's interesting depending on what I'm what kind of information I'm going for it might give me a starting point but rarely is it the sort of thing that I look at and I go oh I got what I needed all right see you later and I think maybe that's what Google is hoping for but uh, that hasn't really been my case maybe I just scrutinize it more I think you know everybody 
is a, a different different level of on that playing field as far as how deeply they're going to scrutinize results like these. Google did show off, you know, recording a video of a problem that you're having and then SGE kind of collecting all of the the possible answers and organizing that into a single thing. That's pretty neat, right? Like, I don't know how to explain this, but this thing isn't working. Can you tell me how this thing works? And it comes back with kind of an organized directional approach for how to tackle the, the solution on that. I think that's pretty neat. I read a Search Engine Land article by Barry Schwartz that talks about kind of how search is changing for Google and how artificial intelligence infusing into it, like what are the impacts there? And I did think one one key piece of information was, what, well, I mean, there was a lot in there that was interesting, but one key piece jumped out at me, which is that Google says click-through rate is higher on AI overview cards than they find on normal search results, which I don't know, that's kind of interesting to me. If, if these summaries are meant to give you the information that you're not that you're already looking for without having to go into some of the other search results to do that. I think that's ultimately the goal, right? Like as otherwise, why are you organizing this and showing it to me at the top of the search results? You want to save me the user that's searching time. Why then is the click through rate higher? And is that a byproduct of a lack of trust in the results or the need to verify, which is something I'm very strong, you know, very highly recommend doing with AI results is, you know, verify, make sure if it gives you sources, check the source, at least jump in there and, and just make sure that, you know, if you're going to do something really important with that information, make sure that information is valid, you know, so is it really saving you time if you're checking everything? Maybe not really, but that might explain why the click through rate is higher. I thought that was interesting. And some of the other things they talked about, Gemini 1.5 Pro expanding from 1 million to 2 million tokens. So doubling the amount of tokens on these systems, which just means just means more context, man. It's crazy how how big and how detailed these systems are getting and the capabilities of crunching all of that information and contextualizing it for you is just really impressive. They talked about ask photos within uh, with Gemini. This would be within the photos app. So you could go into your photos app and you could say something very specifically. The example they gave, of course, was what is my license plate? I'm so bad at that. I do not remember my license plates, hardly ever. And if you have a bunch of photos in your photo, uh, your Google Photos library, it can go through and understand like, oh, this is your car and this license plate is the one you're looking for. So therefore, here it is uh, without you having to kind of de you know, deduct all that stuff on your own. So that's interesting. I'll be curious to play around with that. Gemini 1.5 Flash, which I kind of made fun of on Twitter during the announcement. Cause it's like, really? Flash? The internet? Do you really want to go there? What I didn't realize is the comic book Flash Legion is strong. So apparently I'm old. Adobe Flash, that's so far in the history that no one really jumped right to that except for me. Uh, essentially, Gemini 1.5 Flash meant to be optimized to be faster, uh, also narrower in scope. So, you know, cutting down on that latency time, that, that ping time or the amount of time it takes from your question or what you're looking for to get that answer. But the scope's going to be narrower in order to uh, make that happen, at least for now. Gemini expanding in workspace. So you're going to see, you know, you were already seeing Gemini, the Gemini, Geminification of, you know, things like Docs, Sheets, Slides, Drive, Gmail. That's going to continue, which makes a lot of sense to me. I, you know, I hope they continue to make it more impactful and effective. I'm not just opening up, you know, the capabilities, but make it continue uh, to progress in doing those things well. Uh, Gemini's expansion in workspace includes a virtual teammate that they talked about, which is essentially like agents within workspace. I think that sounds actually pretty cool. You know, I'm a, what What do you call me? A solopreneur, <laughs> independent creator, whatever I am, I'm doing a lot of work on my own right now. And so, being able to create a third party agent, essentially via Gemini using AI that has a specific task or purpose. And so I think the idea that the kind of view here is I've, I've got these tasks. I have to do them all the time. If I was in an office environment, 
I might have someone working underneath me that I could say, hey, could you be the one to manage this or to monitor this or whatever? And like my, my sense here is that you can do some of that within the workspace kind of environment that you can create these AI agents to do certain tasks and to hold certain roles within there. They don't have voices yet, but I bet you that's coming. I bet at some point you'll be able to talk to your uh, your agents. Gemini Gmail, summarize this email thread. That's one thing that's, that's interesting. If you've got like multiple threads or multiple emails within a certain thread and you're like, look, I don't have 10 minutes to read through every single one of these. Like, give me the basics. What are the things I really need to know? You can summarize that uh, in one soup. Also creating automations. So if you get an email and it and it requires a certain piece of information be pulled from like a spreadsheet and then that be uh, you know brought into a new spreadsheet that categorizes and sorts and all this kind of stuff, you can kind of create these automations that tie those things together. And uh, I think that that could be very useful. Although if I'm honest, those are the kinds of features that I feel like sound really powerful and they probably are, but sometimes I have a hard time organizing my brain around making that happen. And uh, so that I, I could envision that being the kind of feature that like it, it's kind of lost on me. I, I got to organ, I got to be more organized than I am to set that up and make it effective. And uh, you know, don't always have a lot of faith in my ability to do that uh, on things like that. One of the things that no doubt got a lot of attention is Astra Project Astra. This is multimodal AI on the phone and of course they showed off a video of a woman walking around an office and getting context pointing it to you know pointing it uh, scanning the room and saying tell me something in this room that makes noise and of course it calls out the speaker and and she's kind of touring the room and then about halfway through she says hey have you seen my glasses and you know the this system the astra system is talking and describing and using its voice and everything so you're having kind of a conversation with it and astra says oh yeah it's over on the desk by a by a red apple and you go over there and suddenly hey it remembered it remembered in in a contextual way the stream of events what it saw all along and it can point back to an earlier moment where it saw what it identified as glasses. And that's what you're asking for. It's over by the red apple. And then, of course, this is like the, um, I would say, being in the audience, this was the moment that got the uh, the audience to go, oh, you know, you kind of saw that or, or heard that echo through Shoreline Amphitheater when people were like, oh, the glasses. She puts on the glasses and she starts doing the same interaction while wearing the glasses. You get some visual representation of what she sees on the screen. You know, at one point she's looking on a whiteboard. She's like, what should I put here in between? You know, it's like server architecture or something like that. What should I put here? And and it knows what it what she means by here. It knows where the arrow is pointing. It knows what to put there. It recommends it. That's important to me. And meanwhile, I have right in front of me right here. I have Google Glass, if you remember this. So I've been curious about this direction since Google's Google Glass announcement, what, 10, more than 10 years ago? I can't remember at this point. This is important because, and, and it's not like we haven't seen this coming, but this is just more indication of where I think a lot of this is heading. We have Rabbit R1. We have Humane AI Pin. We have these companies and these people that are clearly trying to see like, what is an AI forward device? What it actually is that? That isn't our smartphone that already has AI embedded in it, you know, through software and apps and all this stuff. Like, how are they different? What does that form factor look like? And I really do believe that that form factor is glasses. Whether you have a need for glasses or not, all of these interactions, this plate of glass that we put up in front of us, when we want to identify that thing in front of us, you, you have to agree that that experience is made far better if it's realized in a way in which you don't have to hold up the glass anymore. It's just, I'm looking at something, I don't know what that is, I ask it a question or however we query it, and it tells me what I want to know. That's where all this stuff is heading. Um, while I was at Google I.O., 
I um, was talking with Michael Fisher and uh, a few other folks and Nick Gray. Nick Gray from Fandroid was there and he had the Meta glasses and they were transition lenses and I have not worn them yet, but I've been very, very curious about them. And so I put them on and I could hear, you know, the audio coming through the earpiece and, you know, he kind of showed me how the camera works and the, the notification light and, you know, and they're, they're, good looking glasses. Like they actually look like standard sunglasses, maybe a tiny bit thicker, but I mean, not by much. And I don't think that we're very far from that smaller form factor, the form factor that makes it look just like another pair of sunglasses or a pair of glasses. I don't think we're very far to that combining with some sort of maybe limited at first, but some eventually broader scale projection or something onto the lens that allows me to have some sort of a readout of what this information might be. Or if I'm looking at something, having some sort of an overlay that points to the important part, all these things like this is this is happening, folks. It's going to happen at some point. That's where you know, the large part of where all of this AI technology and wearables are converging right now. And it's just a matter of time. So it was really cool to see Google, you know, give that more attention. Last year, they they gave it some attention. I think it had to do with translation. This is like other level stuff. You know, it's multimodal. Next year, when I go to Google I.O., I might just have to wear, they bring my Google Glass and wear it just as a throwback because it could be the year where we really start to see um that progressing for Google. Hey, they were there early on. You got to give them credit for that, right? Gemini Live, which is essentially from a conversational and kind of real sounding and interacting human experience. This is, you know, the, the, the uh, voice that you hear when you interact with some of these models with Astra, for example. Gemini Live is really, you know, a more conversational, more natural sounding voice. And, you know, today on, on AI Inside, Jeff Jarvis and, and Mike Elgin both really had a problem, it sounded like, with the elements that go into that automated voice to make it sound more human, things like vocal fry, you know, that sort of stuff, or, oh, oh. <laughs> you know, just like these different parts of our voice that as humans, is just part of being human. But for a machine or an AI that's, that's attempting to converse with you or be a thing that you want to converse with, Ultimately, I think these companies are really trying to build something that follows the rules that we already follow. And so it's got to talk the language the way we do. It's got to have lower latency on, on the, you know, the, the input and the output. So when it's listening to me and I stop talking, it can't then wait for five seconds before it comes back with its response. That feels unnatural, right? They're working on getting these systems and getting these models honed in to the point to where we, as the real human beings in the conversation, can feel comfortable enough conversing with them and not be not like hit these these roadblocks, these barriers that pull us out of the conversation that make us lose our our place, lose our thought. And I've I've definitely experienced that with at least the previous generation of AI, you know, talking with AI and stuff. And so Gemini Live is is really meant to make the voice sound more natural, similar in in many ways to OpenAI's uh, GPT 4.0. Uh, voice demo, which if you haven't seen it, you got to check it out because it's it's definitely a, a lot of it is about exactly what I'm talking about here. Mike and Jeff seem to have a problem with that. It's like, why why are you trying to imitate the human? I, I see it a little differently. I mean, I'm kind of thinking that, you know, it, if we want to interact with these things, make it so that I don't have to think about anything other than just talking to it the way I'm used to talking to anything or anyone already. You know, if I don't, if I have a, as a user, don't have to relearn anything and I can literally, if it's as easy as just drop right in and say what's on my mind and I get what I'm looking for and I feel comfortable in the conversation, like I'm hearing things that give me the cue that, I don't know, settle me down or put me in the right mindset or don't remove me from the conversation so I lose my my pathway uh, in it. I think those are all really important. So I, I, I tend to disagree a little bit, I think, with them as far as that's concerned. Gems, gems are custom agents. 
So these are really, yeah, that's exactly what it is. Uh, you you can write instructions. You can come back to them as needed. Actually, now that I think about it, gems are very similar to the Gemini virtual teammate that I was talking about earlier. Um, maybe they're kind of, uh, you know, same, same, but different, but there you go. And I'm sure there's going to be, you know, some third party custom gems, uh, in the, in the future. I don't think they announced that, but I would be really surprised if that doesn't happen at some point. Generative AI. So they, Google definitely had some announcements about uh, generative AI VO, which, you know, was a, was a, another one of those moments where people in the, in the audience were like, Whoa, although at the same time, you know, what is VO? First of all, uh, video generation, 1080p output, um, had, you know, they had a, they had a moment where they had Donald Glover, uh, in there to kind of showcase, you know, hey, this is this is good enough for Hollywood. It should be good enough for you. Um, you know, the output, the video that it was that they had cherry picked, hand picked, looked pretty good. But um, you know, I, I there there were there was a moment in the audience at that point where people were kind of you know marveling at the quality. But at the same time, it's interesting to me how quickly we get to the point of. Oh yeah. Okay. I've seen that already. Okay. What, what next? What next? And actually yesterday's announcements were all what next. And, you know, at a certain point, like I said, it's a, it's kind of a wall of noise uh, because it's just boom, 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 boom. You know, what does it take to impress us at this point with AI, you know, balance that with the fact that a lot of this stuff, we only saw the first iterations of these things a couple of years ago. And yet here we are, you know, uh, pretty impressive. So anyways, VO, very curious to play around with that when I get a chance. Imogen 3, which is kind of uh, Google's uh, next generation AI uh, image generator better than before. Basically, I don't have a whole lot to say about that one. Generative AI music. Now, this is just like a personal passion of mine. Um, and they have the music AI sandbox. And you actually saw Mark Ribillier, I think I'm pronouncing his name right, uh, prior to the keynote, live on stage, doing what he does. I, I became familiar with his his work a few years ago on TikTok, and I've always thought he's pretty funny. You should definitely check out his videos on TikTok. Um, He's like a DJ, but he's like a live, you know, freeform DJ, essentially. He's he's making up music as he goes. And he's like, oh yeah, you know, he might he might do a little beatbox or do a, a weird kind of like he's got a he's got a really great voice, actually. Do a weird kind of, you know, vocal thing over the top and get these loops going, and then he gets a nice funky beat and he's playing around with it. And essentially, prior to the keynote, he's showing off how Google's AI uh, systems can create stems in real time based on what he's asking for. And, um, you know, Wyclef Jean uh, was in one of the videos that they played around this, and he called it the infinite crate. Uh, it's endless, said Wyclef. And I can't remember if it was him or somebody else that said it makes music sound, quote, more human. Actually, that that may have been uh, Ribillier. Um, he may have said that. But anyways, as a musician... As a music producer, as a lover of all you know, music technology and seeing where it's developed in the last 20 years and just being amazed at where it's headed, I'm really interested in this. I actually got to go into the AI sandbox at Google and uh, play around with, they had a whole room that was like a DJ room, essentially. And so you have these records and the records are the prompts. So they're really just props for prompts. And you put that on the turntable and then you'd turn the record and that was like your selector of the different prompts from that record. I think I'm explaining this right. This was at least my experience. Then you could select that and it would slot it into one of like five different slots with a little slider. And what that allowed you to do is, you know, put in one slot, a trumpet or one in slot, a reverb or one slot, a, uh, you know, what whatever the sound might be, mallets, you know, a mallets on a drum or whatever. And depending on where your slider was, it wasn't a mixer it wasn't changing the volume what it was was when you'd move the slider for a particular element it would then send a new prompt to the system with that kind of weighted mixture of those sound elements to say okay this but let's de-emphasize the maramba the maramba or whatever they are the dejemb and put further emphasis on the Detroit techno four and four beat or whatever. And th my issue with it is that it took, you know, it, it took a while to process each of those 
little adjustments. So you'd do it, you'd wait like five or 10 seconds, and then you'd finally kind of hear the results. So obviously, if they can get that you know, faster, that's gonna be a lot more magical of a demo. But it was still really cool. It was still really neat. And what it, what it did for me, it illustrated something that I've been thinking about a lot, which is what is a next generation digital audio workstation? If I am a musician and I open up Ableton Live, as I do all the time, to write an idea. I pull down a guitar, I play the guitar, I open up a drum machine, I tap out a drum beat, I do all these things very intentionally. But what if there is a future where the, the, the next generation digital audio workstation is a collaborative approach in this way, where I as a musician am no longer writing just by myself. I might have a general idea for a foundation. Yeah, I want this bass riff. I want it to go over a drum beat that, you know, the basics are this. And, you know, I have the ability to go in there and give it its rigid structure or its uh, specific elements, sound elements. And then I can say, you know what I really want on top of this? I really want a Rhodes piano that uh, has a little bit of extra flair to it. I'm not a very good Rhodes pianist, but take the context of the music that's here and give me three different roads uh, lines, you know, uh, road loops over the top of this. And oh yeah, I like that one. Now uh, let's add a little bit of extra reverb to that. And it becomes an interactive tool for me to fill the gaps of what I don't know how to do. Or it becomes a collaborator because there are many times when I'm making music and I'm like, God, I wish I had someone to bounce ideas off of and kind of get into a, a groove and a flow with. And uh I don't know. This sounds super appealing to me. Like, you know, I thought like, God, should I like start it? <laughs> like, I, like I would even know how to do this, but should I start a company and like start working on the next generation uh, digital audio workstation that does all these things? Hey, if you're watching this and you want to do it, hey, reach out to me. Let me know. I don't know how to do any of that stuff, but I think it's a great idea. Learn LM, which is Gemini fine-tuned for learning. I think that's incredibly powerful. They showed off the learning coach, which is a gem, like I talked about earlier, kind of an agent uh, that's coming soon that allows you to kind of learn with this agent. It's, it, it, it's not going to give you the answers, but it's going to walk you through how you can get to the answers on your own. I think there's huge progress to be made when it comes to education and these AI tools. Sal Khan, founder of, of Khan Academy, was on episode 10 of AI Inside a handful, you know, a couple of months ago, and he talked a lot about this. And actually, consequentially, he was uh, he was part of marketing for OpenAI's GPT-40 with his son showing off some features along this line. And then also he is uh, involved in this in a partnership um, with Learn LM. So that's so he's totally and his book just came out. So you got to check out his book. Also, YouTube teach me about the contents of this video. That's interesting. This is something that I've been doing on my own. I will totally cop to it. The last couple of months, I've been learning a lot on my own. And sometimes the information I need is in a YouTube video. And what I realized at a certain point is like, okay, I'm watching this YouTube video and I'm taking notes as it goes along. Like there's got to be a better way. Like I might miss something. What? Why don't I export this YouTube video to an MP3? feed that MP3 to Revolve to get a transcript, feed that transcript into Perplexity via Claude um, and, you know, ask it to give me a summary of these things. And, you know, through a prompt, I end up with the notes that I would have taken and it saved me like 10, 15, 20 minutes. Now, that's amazing. That's incredibly powerful. It's also potentially troubling because of the way the creator economy on YouTube is built, the foundations of which, at least from YouTube's perspective, is ads. If you are a creator of a certain caliber, of a certain level, you've passed your kind of like regular baseline requirements, then every time you serve a video to someone, there is an ad shown, mid-roll, pre, whatever. And if, if we're all summarizing, then there's no ads being shown. And so as a creator, are creators then less incentivized to continue doing that? If they're making a business from it, they certainly would be if there isn't some sort of compensation for that. And I know that's something that Jeff Jarvis on, on AI Inside you know, has had a problem with from time to time. It's like, do we have to you know, compensate everyone for everything that AI is doing? And I don't think it's an all or nothing thing. But I do think in this case, I mean, take, I mean, just take a look at the impact, right? How many people, how many creators have built a business around creating content for YouTube? 
And maybe it's their fault because they are relying on a platform. You know, Google can do whatever the heck it wants to do with this platform. It's It owns it after all. And so it can do that if it wants to. As a creator, you're kind of hoping that they continue to, to make decisions that allow you to do what you do and make a living if you're doing it to make a living and not doing it just because you enjoy doing it. But if everybody's just summarizing instead of watching those ad, those ad views go down, and if there's no compensation for that, that's going to turn a lot of people off. I, I'm telling you, I see that coming. Um, so will Google come out with a way to compensate? I think that's a really important question. So anyways, that's interesting. Notebook LM, the ability to take in all these multiple sources about a single thing. This is something they announced, I think, last year, Google announced. And then basically harness the AI model to be an expert on just that corpus of information, that corpus of data. And then you can search it, you can query it, you can interact with it, that sort of stuff. Well, the new news is that they're doing audio overviews. So essentially, it's like a podcast of the information that you just fed it. That's really interesting. Very, very cool stuff. Might be a, a cool way to uh, get a crash course on something. Given, you know, like I, I have issues sometimes with uh, the voice models. And if I can determine that they are not real, I can only listen to them for so long before I just kind of get about it. And then finally, I just got to mention this at the very end. It's Android because Google really mentioned this at the very end, right? Android was saved for day two for the most part, except for a few things, but uh, AI scam detection. So this is essentially if you have an Android phone and you get a phone call and you, and you have this active, this is opt in, not opt out. So you have to turn it on. And essentially it's doing on-device interpretation of your conversation to know if at a certain point that unknown number that comes through, because it's always an unknown number that would do this, is going down the road of scam or what they know it to be a scam. Like, oh, you know, um, we are your bank. There's been some mysterious activity we need for you to work with us right now so that we can redirect the money into a different account so you don't lose your money. There are people that will fall for this, right? There are people that do fall for this. This is a real big deal because the people who are perpetrating this are really good. They're really good at social engineering. My mom almost fell for this not too long ago. And uh, thankfully she did not. She she clued in on it. But this this one hit really home, you know, hit home for me. And, uh, you know, so it's using on-device AI to analyze, to understand what that is, when it's happening. And then when it recognizes the pattern, it recognizes what's going on based on that conversation, based on the unknown number and all these other signals, it puts, you know, it buzzes your phone. It puts that alert on the screen and says, ah, you don't want to do this. A bank will never ask you to do this. Uh, this is, this is likely a scam. That's fantastic. That is a wonderful feature. And I, I know for certain that's going to help a lot of people. Gemini Nano, multimodal functionality across device. And I think the big news here is, you know, as Gemini Nano becomes more and more kind of integrated into Android, now they're they're getting it to the point to where they can extend the context out. And the, the way they demonstrate that is by putting a PDF in there and being able to, um, you know, understand it and, uh, and query against that across your device, across your apps, all different kinds of things. So uh, Gemini Nano getting more powerful uh, on Android. Anyways, those are just a, those are just a few of the things that I had on my mind from yesterday's keynote at Google I/O. I will say it was wonderful to be there. It was really great to have myself to put myself into that environment and to you, you just learn so much by the by the uh, reaction of people to get the temperature. It seemed like seemed like people who were there were maybe a little more interested and excited about the things than people who are watching uh, from home gave it credit for because, you know, and Mike Elgin actually pointed this out on AI Inside today, is that, you know, there's something about like when Apple has an event, there's always, you know, people who work at Apple who are cheerleaders, essentially, who are, who are raising the intensity and the energy of excitement. And in Shoreline, it's just a, it's a huge cavernous space. It's hard to, to raise that that intensity there, especially with like a tech conference, you know, keynote. And so when you're watching it online, it can feel a little dry and it can feel a little bland. And I don't think it was helped by the fact that every, it was just a wall of AI noise. And I love this stuff. I'm interested in it. And I even got pretty overwhelmed by it. I mean, it was just one thing after another. At a certain point, it was so many new AI features 
that it became really hard to differentiate and to know what the last 10 things were that they said because they're, oh, they're already on to the next thing, you know? But uh, it just it does go to show just how important all this stuff really is for Google. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed me just opening up a, a record here and sharing a little bit of my thoughts, expanded thoughts on Google I.O. yesterday. Definitely going to be talking more about this on Android Faithful next week. So that would be May 21st, the Tuesday, May 21st episode of Android Faithful. We're going to be talking all about all of our thoughts on everything from Google I.O. on a deeper level. If you did miss this week's episode, definitely check it out. We sat down with Samir Samat and Dave Burke from the Android team to talk about a lot of this stuff and how it integrates with Android. It's a tradition that we've had for a number of years now, and we're just so grateful that we get to continue doing it uh, year after year. So so you can find that, uh, go to androidfaithful.com. Also make sure you're subscribed here on the Techsploder YouTube channel so you don't miss more moments like this when I decide, hey, I'm gonna fire up a camera and just talk. Thanks for listening, everybody. We'll see you next time.